Good morning, friends, and welcome to all of you as we celebrate today the second Sunday in the season of Advent. It's a new church year, and this is our second week in the year, and it's great to have you all here. I'm delighted to be joined by Michael, who's at the uh, computer back there, and sometimes the camera. We've got Bill here, who is our assisting minister. Heidi, as usual, thank you to Heidi and Matt for the beautiful prelude. We have Katie up there at the organ standing by for some hymns, and we've got Jim back there in the booth. We're all spread out. We're wearing masks as much as possible and keeping safe, but we're delighted that you joined, joined in this morning or whenever it is that you may watch this video. We are going to be celebrating Holy Communion today. It's the first Sunday of the month, so if you, if you haven't prepared for that and you would like to, you might take a few moments just to get your bread and wine set for your communion toward the end of the service. We have something special today. We, we've had a number of people that have decided they wanted to join the congregation, even when the congregation isn't meeting. And so I've had some meetings with them online, and uh, Ralph and Diane Lavin have helped out with that. And we decided that we would make today New Members Sunday, and we're going to show actually a brief video that will introduce you to some of the new folks that are joining our congregation. So welcome to our new members this morning. We begin our service today with our confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily, worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. My friends, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
grace of our, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Stir up our hearts, Lord God, to prepare the way of your only Son. By his coming, strengthen us to serve you with purified lives through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
for Israel and will care for her as a shepherd cares for the sheep. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says our, your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out. And I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother's sheep. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Reading from 2 Peter, Peter is writing to Christians who, in his view, doubt the coming of Christ and that are drawn to immoral living. Do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved and the elements will melt with fire. But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. The word of the Lord. Thank Thank be to God. God. gospel today comes from the very first chapter of the gospel according to St. Mark. Mark, as you may recall, is the, the gospel from which we will do all our, most of our gospel readings during this new Advent year. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. 
Glory to you, O Lord. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair, with him with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before I begin talking about Mark, I want to say another word of thanks. Um, that beautiful song that was sung, Comfort, Comfort My People, was played by Matt and sung by his daughter Charlotte. So thanks to Matt and Charlotte for sending that in. And how old is Charlotte? She's high school age. She's 16 years old and sounds, sings beautifully and is willing to share that with us. I wish you were here to see her. I wish you were here to, to be with us all. But she did send that in and we're very grateful. So today we begin with the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, in fact, the first verse. Now, it's always good to give each of the Gospels their own say so that we can give the story its due and see the, the story from the particular writer's perspective. Sometimes in our minds we conflate all of these Gospel stories together and we, we sort of assume that they all say exactly the same things in the same way, they all contain the same things, but but that's not exactly the way it is. Now Matthew, for example, begins with this long genealogy which is designed to, to help us understand how Jesus is connected to the people of the Old Testament. And Luke begins, where we love him to begin, in the story of Jesus' birth with all of the angels and the shepherds. John, of course, begins in heaven. He doesn't begin on earth at all. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Not Mark. Mark begins in a different way. Now, have you ever gotten to a, a movie theater a little bit late and you, you find your way to your seat in the dark and you sit down and the movie's already started 10 or, 10 or so minutes early and there you sit in the dark trying to figure out what in the world is going on. Who are these people? What are their characters? Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? And where are we in the plot? It's frustrating, isn't it? Well, I mention that because that's exactly where Mark begins his story. Mark starts in the middle of the story. Now, the others give us other kinds of parts of Jesus' life, but Mark starts right here at the baptism of Jesus. We figured that Jesus lived to be 30 to 33 to 34 years old as he walked the face of the earth, and Luke tells us that, that Jesus began his ministry at age 30, so that's where we are starting in Mark. Jesus is already 30 years old. There's no birth story, there are no shepherds, there are no angels. Now, if you had not heard the story, and this was the only reference you had to the story, the gospel story of Jesus, you'd be starting in the dark. You'd be sitting there in the dark wondering, who is this guy? Where, where did he come from? How old is he? And, and where has he been before this? What was he doing out in the wilderness before he stepped into the river with John? Who are his parents? Why should we pay attention to this person? Nothing but questions. But that's exactly what Mark has in mind for us. You see, Mark wants to be mysterious, and he wants the answers about who Jesus is to slowly unfold as the story unwinds before us. He lays out some details, but not nearly as many as we would like to have. Even the characters all through the story are a little on the confused side. His family, his friends, his disciples, his antagonists. No one seems really to get who Jesus is. Now, the Gospel of John tells us plainly, this is God we're talking about. There's no mistaking it from the very beginning. Here, Mark calls this the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, but no one, no one in the story seems to get it. Well, 
not quite known because there are two very unusual characters, two figures in the whole book that understand who Jesus is. The first one appears a few verses later as Jesus begins his ministry and he goes into a synagogue and finds a man with a demon possession. And the demon spots him. And the demon knows exactly who he he is. And in the very first chapter of Mark's story, the demon yells, I know who you are. You are the Son of God. What have you to do with me? And then at the very end, the last chapter of the book, only one other character fully understands who Jesus is. And once again, a very strange choice. Jesus has been crucified by the Roman soldiers. The Roman centurion who stood there watching and seeing to the crucifixion now sees Jesus hanging from the cross in his death. And he is the other one who finally says, truly, this was the Son of God. And no one else. No one else comes close to realizing who Jesus is in the story of Mark. He's a great teacher, of course, that's obvious. He's a wonderful healer, absolutely. He's a strong leader, certainly. But beyond that, people are completely confused about who Jesus is. What a strange way to tell a story. (laughs) And what a strange way to tell the greatest story ever told. Now, Mark does give us some interesting details about John the Baptist. He's living out there in the wilderness. He's baptizing people that are coming to him from all over the countryside who hear about his preaching and repentance. And so he baptizes them. Strangely, Mark tells us what he ate in the wilderness. Now, we don't hear what others eat in the, in the story, but we hear what John ate for some reason. Locusts and wild honey. Only a diet that Bear Grylls, Bear Grylls could appreciate. And John is the one, Mark tells us, that the prophet Isaiah, 800 years before, had told about. John understands his role. Isaiah said there would be one crying in the wilderness to help prepare the way of the Lord, and John knows that this is his job. He says that someone greater is to follow. He knows that there is another one to come. Someone that he is not worthy to serve, not even to untie his shoes. But for now, John is content to do his part to preach repentance and to have people come to him at the Jordan River. Because when this other person comes, he will come not to baptize with water, but with the Holy Spirit and and to put a fire in people's hearts. So Jesus is about to enter the story, but we haven't read that yet. In fact, because it's Advent and we like to wait for the coming of Christ, we put the reading of Jesus' baptism off until the new year after the 12th day of Christmas when we celebrate Jesus' baptism in January. For now, we simply hear how John's story is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ and how John's story is connected to Isaiah. So... My friends, what's the beginning of your story? Was it begun at the moment of your birth? Or at the moment of your conception? Or was it perhaps the gleam that your mother saw in your father's eye? A lot of people mark the beginning of their faith story at their baptisms. And we Lutherans, we we oftentimes lose track of when our baptisms are because so many of us were baptized as as infants. some of our friends here are baptized as adults or as, as, uh, as teenagers. We have some Baptists in our church. We have some people from non-denominational churches, perhaps even charismatic churches, and they have a, a different custom. And I know many of you out there are, are from these customs. And you folks tend to mark your faith journey at the day of your baptism, which probably you strongly remember because you were old enough to decide on matters of faith and you were probably dunked deep in a pool with full immersion. Where does your faith story begin? Now, there's something I want to tell you about your pastor, and I I don't mean just me, I mean all of your pastors, whenever you have them, whoever they are. You see, pastors don't actually baptize anyone. That might sound like a surprise, because apparently we do. Well, we do a lot of baptisms, and it's one of our most joyful things to do, and certainly I have done my share of baptisms over the years, too many to count. One, I had one baptism this summer, but because we couldn't gather here with the family in the church, we did it down at Iverson Park at the Plover River, and there I rolled up my pants legs and took off my shoes, as did the parents, 
We stepped into the waters of the Plover River and we baptized there Eliana Stofflet, a beautiful baby that someday when we're all gathered together, you will get to see. We'll introduce you to her personally. There we were, gathered in the river. Just to get in the right mood that morning, I had gone out and I collected a couple of grasshoppers and used those for breakfast and washed them down with a little wild honey. <laughs> well, just kidding. But honestly, I really did feel a little bit like John the Baptist, standing there knee-deep in the river, baptizing Eliana. But as I said, pastors do not do the baptizing. That's God's job. In fact, when I baptize, you might notice um, the, the liturgy says that the pastor may say, you are baptized in the name of, or I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. And I never use that first one because I'm always mindful that I am not doing the, baptiz the baptizing. God is doing that. So I said to Eliana, you are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we pastors, we do like John does like John did. He pronounced the good news coming. We stand in the river to do our baptism and to do our part. But mostly we point the way to the Messiah. But it is Jesus who creates new life in baptism. As John says, he comes to us and fills us with fire and changes our hearts. I like what Luther said about it, just to clarify so that we weren't confused about this. Luther said, it's not the water that does these things nor is it the pastors, I would add, but it is God's word with the water that gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit and transforms our lives. It is God's promise that makes all this happen. So I want you to think for a moment about your own baptism today. And whether it happened in a river or in a large pool or just with a, a tiny font, think about your own baptism. Perhaps you can remember it, perhaps you can't. You may not even remember the name of the pastor who baptized you, but surely you know that your baptism was God's doing. The Holy Spirit brought your parents together into the congregation so that you could be a part of the family of God. Surely you know that this was all God's doing. And just as he sent John to point the way to Jesus, he sends pastors and parents and grandparents and godparents and friends and congregations point the way to Jesus. And he baptizes us with water and with fire, the fire that comes from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God. So my friends, your baptism is part of the story of the gospel, which means that you are connected to Jesus' story and the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your story is wound up in his story. So what was begun so long ago in the Jordan River, all those miles and years away, is being continued right here in Wisconsin and in California and Washington State and Nevada and Texas and North Carolina, not to mention Australia and New Zealand and Germany. I mention all of those different places because I know those are the places that we've heard people are tuning in to some of our worship broadcasts. And I want you all to know that you were included. All of those places that come to join us to hear the story that began with John the Baptist around the year of our Lord, 30 AD. So I guess if you count the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ as including your story and my story right here in the year 2020, then I guess Mark's story doesn't begin in the middle. It is actually pretty close to the beginning. And that's as close to the beginning as we'll get this week and during the season of Advent. Now, if you want to hear the story right from the very beginning, then you'll have to wait just a bit as we turn to the season of Christmas and we hear the story of Jesus' birth from the beginning from the Gospel of Luke. We hear the story even as far back as when Jesus was only just a gleam in his father's eye. And don't worry, if you like angels, Luke has plenty of angels. That's a pretty good story, too, so I hope you'll be there. So as we like to say in this medium of <laughs> broadcast, just stay tuned. Amen.
justice set everybody free. People of Israel, you heard the prophet tell, Virgin Mother will bear Emmanuel. She conceived him God with us, a mother whose birth restores hope and courage to children. and valleys will have to be prepared. While my ways open, new protocols declare. For here God is nearing in beauty and grace. All clear every gateway in haste, out in haste. We first saw Jesus, a baby, The congregation at Trinity, we're doing a new member uh, presentation uh, with several uh, couples. And our first couple today, we'd like to introduce you to Randy and Sally Olson. Good morning. Uh, I'm Randy, and I've been in Stevens Point since 1985. Uh, I came here with the university where I taught for 30 years before my retirement. I taught astronomy and also ran the planetarium and the observatory for those 30 years. I uh, retired in 2015. I'm Sally Olson and I've been in Stevens Point since 95 when Randy and I were married. I'm a retired social worker. I was in Milwaukee for about 25 years prior to moving to Stevens Point. And then I worked here at CAP Services for another 20 years before retiring also in 95. Uh, Randy and I were both um, raised in what was formerly the Evangelical United Brethren Church in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, um, which then became the United Methodist Church in New involved in that um, community for a while. And we're, we're really happy to be part of the, the Trinity um, faith community. You've been very welcoming. We've enjoyed the choir um, and look forward to really participating when, when times will allow for, for us to do that again. I think we're all feeling that way. Thank you. We've been participating and uh, have been part of the choir and uh, a couple other uh, committees for almost two years. So that's our background. I'd like to, we'd like to also introduce to you to a young couple that were um, married in Trinity last spring. And there are Kim and John Timmerman. We'll let them share a few words with you. Hello, everyone. My name is John Timmerman. This is my wife, Kimberly. Hello. We were just recently married in May, back in May 9th. Um, we are newly joined members of the church. Uh, we are looking forward to meeting each and every one of you. When church does resume, um, in the meantime, you get to see our ugly mugs in this video. <laughs> so um, we hope to see you all. and. Uh, we hope you all have a very wonderful holiday season and God bless you. God we, bless. Will, we will get over this, this, this year and this virus. Thank you very much. God bless you. As we always do when we receive new members, part of the ritual is to say the creed. It's a way for the new members to stand before us and declare with us what we all believe together. Today we're going to recite the creed, but the Advent creed today. Please join us. 
We believe in God the Father, ruler of the universe, creator of all and giver of life. With patience and hope, he waits for us to see him, to love his creation and all its people. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, who once came to us to live as God with us, who will come again one day to be God for us. He loves us with a powerful passion and has given his life and has risen from the grave for the forgiveness of our sins against God. We look forward to the day when he comes to us again. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the living, moving power that blows like a wind among us, who empowers us, renews us, and strengthens us for our journey of faith. Amen. God of power and might, comfort your people and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. Faithful God, you teach us to wait for you with faithfulness and patience. Sustain and support us in our doubts and questions. Nurture our faith as we discern and, en and enact your mission and show us how to be your faithful people in this era of pandemic loving one another, and providing comfort where we can. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Loving God, you set the stars in the sky and breathe life into the earth. Renew the face of creation where it is in need of your healing touch. Mend the wounds of environmental damage and restore balance to ecosystems so that all creation can declare your praise. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. Steadfast God, you never tire of seeking justice. Where people suffer from discrimination, judgment, and injustice, use our voices to speak words of truth and comfort. We pray especially for our nation as it undergoes its transition of power and bring healing to our cities torn apart by racial tension and violence. Lead us toward a world where faithfulness will sprout underfoot and righteousness rain down from above. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. Leading God, you ask us to make uneven ground smooth, make even the disparities between your people, sustain and support people with physical and intellectual disabilities, accompany disability advocates who work for a world accessible to all. Teach us to celebrate the great diversity in our midst. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Tender God, you know sorrow and joy alike. We pray for those in our families and congregation who are not joyful in this holiday season. Comfort those who grieve. Be a companion to all who are lonely. Tend to those who are sick or struggling with depression and gather all people in your healing embrace. Today we pray especially for my niece who is in the hospital. Prayers for Brad, Jerry, and Alina. Pray for Lauren and Jeff. Prayers for Stephen, John, and Elena. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy, mercy is great. great. Eternal God, we give thanks for the saints who have prepared your way in the wilderness and taught us to continue their faithful work. Make their generous lives an example for all. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. And we pray, loving God, for other members of our, our congregation who we know are in need of healing. We pray for Sybil as she recovers from surgery, as well as Dan recovering from his, for Dan and Jerry as they undergo chemo treatments. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, may the peace of Christ be with you always. And may you find time during the day to greet one another, whether personally or by telephone, with the peace of Christ. Amen.
thank you to the Trinity Choir who have come to us today through the magic of the technology and artistry of all of these people. It's great to have you with us again. We turn now to Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right to, to give, give our, our thanks, thanks and, and praise. praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. our Lord Jesus took bread. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He blessed it and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With the disciples and the saints of every time, we pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, my friends, in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to commune with me and with others that might be with you and those who are gathered here. Before we do, I'd like to suggest that if you are with others, that you serve one another this morning. And also, I'd like to suggest that as I speak the promise of Christ being with us, that you repeat those words aloud in your home so that the, the promise of God rings in your home as well as here. So now please take the bread that you prepared, break it, and give it to yourself or to one another with these words. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ, broken for you, broken for me. Now, please take the wine, pour it into your cups, and serve it to one another or to yourself with these words. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for me. And if you happen to have little ones or others who are not receiving communion this morning gathered with you, please offer them a blessing. And I suggest you place your hands on their head or on their shoulders and say their name with these words. Child of God, may the Lord keep you in his light and love forever. Child of God, may the Lord keep you in his light and love 
forever. And now let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And receive this blessing. And through the Spirit may you dwell in peace arising from Emmanuel. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you and Christ's child is coming. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.